Today I want to introduce the idea of macro systems, and you've actually seen a macro uh, system uh, when I introduced the idea of the do notation. So now we're going to le learn a bit about how you would go about and um, recreate or understand that macro. Uh, first of all, what is a macro? Um, and a macro is this technique uh, that allows you to do source-to-source uh, -source, uh, code transformations. Uh, and the main objective is extending the language semantics. Uh, but you will see that it may also uh, it may also be things that are a bit more trivial that are not much about the language per se, but just to enrich or or simplify certain libraries. Uh, so there are three things that are important, uh, three ideas that are important in the macro systems. Uh, first of all is defining the macro. And this is explaining uh, programmatically how the source code transformation will work. Uh, and the basic idea behind a macro system is really like a, a mini compiler that you have, right? Or, or you can extend the compiler or, or the parser to generate more code, if you will. Uh, so the macro system is known as the language that is used to describe these transformations. So it could be the same language as the source um, programming language. It could be a slightly different one. It could just be an API to access, you know, the AST nodes and all that. Uh, and then there's the process known as macro expansion, which is um, essentially the procedural part of it, where where uh, you take the macro system, you use the language to describe how you perform the transformation, the macro expansion is the act of performing the transformations. Uh, so macro expansion occurs before the program is run and compiled. So let's look at a few examples. The first example is the one you are already familiar with, uh, which is the do notation. So in this case, we wrote this do, and then an X, an arrow, and then something, and then something else. And this is actually syntactic sugar for a bind operator, uh, where the order of the things that appear in differently, right? As you can see, for instance, the push appears here, uh, and this X appears inside the lambda, uh, and the result, there's a lambda that is, its body is pop, and pop is defined after. So the, the context, everything is different. The, I mean, the uh, the syntactic context or syntactic scoping can be changed because you have full control over the code that is being generated. Um, another example is you, for instance, could define a macro that just discards some of its arguments. So it kind of looks like a function call, but it's not, right? So in this case, uh, there are some tokens that appear. So it's a bit more expressive than a function call uh, or, or the notation of a function call, if you will. Um, so in this particular case, comment out, we are removing or, or discarding this uh, AST term, uh, which means uh, you would just return the second parameter, and whatever is here would be ignored. So particularly, you see that there's a division by zero that this is not uh, run. So macros, they actually power the Racket language. A lot of the features that you have access to, they are created by means of macros. Uh, they can encode in fixed notation. They can encode alternative evaluation methods, as we will see in, a, in the next few slides. Uh, they can be used to generate boilerplate code. For instance, if you think about how structs work and the fact that you have accessors, you know, like uh, name of struct minus some field, uh, and having those functions, that can all be generated with uh, with a, a macro or a macro system. Um, you can encode different programming models. Uh, as we've learned a lot in this course, um, most of the techniques that exist in programming languages, they're not that complicated to implement. Um, then what you have is just this syntactic veneer to simplify its usage. So uh, macros can achieve that. They, they can use this encoding, this library of, let's say, promises, and you can wrap them around uh, in a nicer syntax that makes it a bit more intuitive. Um, so now let's think about how are macro systems used in, in practice. Uh, 
uh, first of all, most of uh, Racket's programming language features are built with macros. Uh, and you can even inspect it by, by going through the source code of Racket. Um, and you will notice that that is, in, in fact, the case. Um, another case, in other programming languages, for instance, OCaml, it has its own uh, macro system. And a very common use for macros is code generation. So, for instance, you define a struct or a, an object or whatever, and somehow there's this um, automatic uh, JSON or XML serialization, right? Where you, you whenever you, you have an instance of a certain a value or, or an instance of a certain object, you have automatically an XML or a JSON representation of that same value that you can save to disk and then load from the disk to recreate the same value. Um, it's also important to, or used quite a lot in boilerplate generation, uh, the idea where you have bridges or um, foreign function interfaces. Uh, basically, whenever you want to call, let's say, from OCaml to JavaScript, um, there is a lot of um, things you have to do if you want to do it from first principles, let's say. Uh, macros can simplify uh, the usage, let's say in this case, the usage of JavaScript via OCaml, by generating a lot of things that you have to do all the time uh, that cannot be abstracted away in a function. Um, for instance, in Rust, um, there are uh, macro systems to simplify um, the access to glib, which is a, a popular C library that gives you a no object oriented programming. Uh, runtime interface. So you can have, you can access the C, uh, a C library's object oriented programming um, runtime with a, a syntax that is very close to Rust by using a macro system. Um, okay, so now let's think a bit about what are the problems of macros. Why are they not uh, super common or what are the problems of them? Um, one of the big difficulties of macros is because they're so powerful, it's unclear what is their computational model, like, right? So what does a macro do? You have to look at its code. You cannot assume anything about it because it can, it's a compiler, right? It can generate any code that can do anything. So essentially you, you lose this uh, predictability. So really macros need to be very carefully crafted and uh, not it needs it cannot be something that is it needs to be very well explained as well so the the what's happening needs to be clearly explained to the user so that there are no um surprises um they also have limited composability because uh because again of the unclear computation model right if you are compose if you're trying to compose different computational models uh, it might be impossible uh, and macros give you do not help you in that way they might you might create a macro to compose or to integrate two systems as i showed you for instance if you want to go from uh, rust to glib um, but the idea but compositability is not transparent again because it's uh, not possible to know it's impossible to know what is the computation model from uh, just looking at a macro call. Uh, another problem that may occur, and the, that also depends on the macro system, but usually what happens is that uh, macros will generate some code, but the code is accessible. Like if you throw an exception, you will still see uh, in, in the stack trace code that is from the macro. Uh, code that the user cannot see, right? Because this was generated. So it's for the programmer, it, it is confusing because they will be looking at something that is unclear. Like, for instance, if you ever used uh, JUnit and you have um, a test case that fails, you will see the library, a bit of the lib of a bit of the internal state of the lib of JUnit when you a test fails. You will see that there's some framework like the on the bottom of the uh, stack trace you have like some weird stuff. So think of it like this way. Uh, this effect, this this problem occurs also with macros, right? Because you are generating code, code that you have no idea what it is, uh, and there's no way to encapsulate it. At least usually. Uh, another problem is 
macros usually are very powerful and it just means that you the macro system itself or its transformation may not terminate which is a problem uh, because it means that your compilation stage or parsing stage could uh, halt right or could not not halt <laughs> that's the problem we hope it halts but um, with a macro system you can make like an endless loop an infinite loop that would uh, just mean you would never be able to even load your program uh, so it is a problem um, and then imagine debugging a macro system is again another yet another level of difficulty right if something goes wrong um, again um, because it's hard to encapsulate errors uh, it might not be very obvious uh, what's going on why something is failing if your macro is not well done uh, so there are some uh, for instance macro uh, racket provides some functionality for that where you can uh, enforce certain constraints and give certain better error messages uh, but it is a problem on itself right it, it's it's really like designing a framework where you have to be very careful on what kind of errors you provide and all that stuff so I guess the bottom line is that you should be very careful and uh, use macros spar sparingly and with uh, some caution. So only do it when you know what you're doing. Uh, they shouldn't be used, um, you know, for, for things that are not really meant to be done with a macro. So next, what we're going to look at is um, how, we're we're, how we can manipulate the syntactic elements. Uh, aka the, the ST of, of Racket in this case, how we can define macros uh, and control the evaluation of an expression. And we also introduced the idea of micro hygiene, which is actually very important for homework eight. It actually shows up there again, this problem. Um, so first, one thing that I've been talking about is that macros manipulate syntactic terms. Uh, by this, I usually mean they, they're talking about, they, they manipulate the concrete syntax, ultimately what the compiler sees. Um, so it's basically a function that takes a term, um, an AST term, like a, a, a datum, and changes it. Um, this is actually something that we'll be doing in Homework 8. Homework 8 is a compiler, which is very close to a macro system. Um, macro systems do not operate at the usually do not operate on the lexical level although although as I will show you in a few slides sometimes they may uh, and by lexically I mean they usually the macro system doesn't parse any text it's simply accessing you know the quote the quoted term directly or even something more high level like uh, an AST node or an AST directly So let's look at a few examples. Um, when you are, again, I talked about macro expansion, just to recap for those who don't remember, the idea of macro expansion is just the transformation stage where you take, uh, where you're applying the, the macro rule. Um, so it, it, it's really macro expansion is the process of uh, manipulating the, the code itself. Um, so one question, and this depends on your macro system, is whether or not it supports uh, structured data. Uh, so for instance, in, at the C level, um, it only looks at input as just as text. The, the macro system is implemented on top of text. That's what it sees. Um, so for instance, if you define addition as a macro that takes two parameters, x, y, there is really no notion of this is just expanding to x plus y, uh, which means there is no notion of um, priority or any assumption about whether x and y are together, like your natural interpretation. So I'll give you an example to make this a bit more clear. So for instance, if you write add 1, 2 times 3 in, in C, this will expand to 1 plus 2 times 3, and note that 2 times 3 will be um, multiplied together. Whereas the expectation would be that 1 plus 2 would, would be uh, added together first, and then the result multiplied by 3. 
right? Uh, if you want to do that in C, you would have to put parentheses around uh, the X and the Y. So um, in Racket, for instance, this is not the case. Uh, you can define a macro very easily with this code. Um, and it does understand the notion of structure. So add one, two is literally is going to expand to plus one, two right here. Uh, so it always will always be nine and not uh, two and not seven, right? Which is two times three, six plus one, seven, which is um, an incorrect assumption, I guess. But this is just some, some, the way the C macro system works, which is uh, simpler to implement, but of course, uh, way harder to use uh, for a macro user, right? So you have to be very careful. Um, so th this is a, I, I went ahead and I, I searched on Stack Overflow for um, horrible cases of abusing of um, C macro systems. And this is one where you have this code. And this looks almost like perfectly fine C code, except that there's this little do dollar sign in three points. Um, and what the dollar sign does, let's see, well, it's doing a logging. So if you want to, to print out some logging information in this particular API, you would just write the dollar sign, which is really weird because if you try to copy paste this code, it would never work because dollar is, would give you a compiler error. Um, and if you follow this link, if you look at the slides in the HTML format, um, there are more examples. Weirder examples, as you can see. Um, and here's one, the one I pasted. Okay, but there's more, I'm gonna show you a few more. Uh, another example is, uh, um, the born shell. So bash is based on that. Um, and this is code from the seventies. And in the seventies, people were using this language called Algol that is very influential to mostly every programming language now. But, um, the idea is that they wrote the macro system that would make the C code look like Algol. So if you look at this code, uh, highlighted in blue, uh, this is very close to Algol, the syntax of Algol. Although uh, the C preprocessor will expand this to real C code. And this is code that was working on an operating system and running on an operating system. So it's not some, you know, freak accident that someone did this for fun. This was actually being used in production. So you can actually go through, if you follow the, the link, you will see an example where there's lots of code all written in what looks like Algol. Let's see. So this is another thing that it, it really breaks the assumption that you should be looking at C, but now you're looking at something that doesn't look like C, although it is C. Um, then there's this uh, interesting paper I read and I wanted to share with you where it's really... Um, a study on the love-hate relationship with the C preprocessor where they interviewed uh, people on why they used macro systems, what was bad about it, what was good about it, and that kind of stuff. Um, so usually in, you know, open source software and that kind of... So these are a few examples. As you can see, for instance, um, there is this case where uh, there's an if condition and the macro is adding another condition only when a certain compiler feature is enabled, compile time feature is enabled. So if this flag is enabled, then you have an extra end happening, otherwise it won't. So oftentimes there's actually um, new, more modern programming languages have implemented uh, techniques to work around these um, you know, to do it a bit better than this way. This, we can do better than this. Um, and for instance, in Rust, you, you can have like flags that you enable and disable and, and have code that is only compiled for, for when the, the tag is enabled. Uh, but you're, you're not 
this is really crazy, right? Because you're you're kind of enabling a part of of a sub expression, which is weird. Um, all all to save all to save some some typing. Uh, another example is even more insidious, perhaps, uh, which is open. You see, function open to open a file uh, has a different signature in different operating systems. So uh, in Unix, you have this uh, operation, this um, mode, and in MS DOS, you have uh, another way to signify that the file is uh, readable and writable. So rather than having a function that abstracts open for two different operating systems. Um, this is all from the Vim editor, by the way. What the developers decided to do is just whenever they do an open, they have this in place. Um, which is, you know, it's harder to read. You have to think about, oh, if I'm in this operating system, I have this call, but not this code. You know, and if I'm in this other operating system and this code is disabled, but this is enabled, uh, and they're actually, the, the, op the they are actually mutually exclusive, so you can never have both. So there's a lot of stuff going on that is even not even apparent. You have to understand what the macros um, define mean. So what does do these ifs mean? And that actually depends on the operating system, their interpretation, and the compilers as well. Another example also from the Vim code is um, where the function signature, again, is different. Uh, according to the operating system. So there's one more parameter in the code they're writing. So this message net beans changes and actually the function name changes. So this is, there's a different function that exists with a different signature, uh, but actually its code is shared between both functions. Okay, so in the next video we're gonna cover, so this kind of concludes uh, weird or, yeah, not very good examples or, or perhaps surprising examples of usage of macros in C uh, that exist in, in production. Um, so next I want to cover how the macro system works in Racket.